Hey, if you've been with us for a while, um, you would know that we've been, uh, we started out sort of before the floods hit and we, we started a series on faith and we've just been talking about uh, faith and what is this thing that we call faith and, and uh, sort of dancing around that topic and we want to keep um, dancing around that topic of faith uh, for a little bit longer. Um, last week uh, we kind of talked inadvertently around faith but this week I want to sort of get back in that lane uh, of faith and talk about uh, this issue of faith. We've covered a bit of ground with it. If you haven't been here, you can go on. There's a YouTube channel there and you can catch up with, with what we've been talking about. But we're just trying to, I'm trying to slowly build a bit of a picture of what faith is, um, who has faith and, and what faith means because um, I think faith is a, a, a very broad um, topic but it's also something that when we hear the word faith, we instantly think of religious groups. But, but faith is something that every human being on planet Earth has, and faith is actually something that we all live by faith. Everybody lives by faith, whether they realise it or not. Uh, they might not know what the object of that faith is that they live by, but everybody lives by faith because we don't know everything, and every day we're trusting somebody else's word, somebody else's character, somebody else's nature. Uh, I, I went downtown during the, 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 the floods, and... Um, I, I won't mention where, but I, I, I went to get some, some petrol somewhere and um, I just read online that this particular petrol station had uh, petrol there and that the petrol was clean. And, and it probably is. I preface by saying maybe it is. Maybe I just got a really bad top, top 10 litres. And so we were running a generator downtown uh, feeding, uh, feeding people in the community and I, I went to get uh, a fuel from this place and brand new generator, only bought it two weeks early, had been running like clockwork every day. I filled up the can, came back, put the fuel in, turned on the generator and it lasted three minutes and died. So I went over and we restarted, died again. Went over again, died again. In the end, me and this other guy picked the generator up, we tipped it upside down, drained all of the fuel, this full jerry can of fuel out of the generator, put it back down. Then I got up and I drove up the top of the hill here to another servo, found more fuel, went back down, poured that fuel in, and with that new fuel, guess what? Didn't skip a beat, hasn't stopped running from that point on. So I had faith in that moment that the information I was given, that this fuel was going to be okay, turns out that that little batch of fuel, it wasn't real good. Uh, but again, by faith, I just went and got fuel, assuming that it would be good, and it turns out it wasn't. But 99.9% .9 of the time, I go and get fuel. And guess what? It's very, very good fuel. But I do it by faith, because I don't go to a petrol station and pull a little bit of fuel out and run a, under a Bunsen burner. Well, it wouldn't a Bunsen burner, I'd blow up. But <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't get that fuel out. Bang! You can see why they didn't like me in a science lab. Um, keep me away from science and scissors. They were two things I wasn't allowed to touch. Um, but I don't get that and test that fuel and do all the things on it to make sure that it's perfect and not going to damage my engine before I put it in. I just go up there, pick up the thing, pull the trigger and pour it in, hoping somebody else has done their job. I'm really trusting Shell. I'm really putting faith in Ampol. I'm putting faith in whoever the company is. I'm putting faith in, in the milk that I pour on my breakfast in the morning that they've pasteurised and homerised and all the other eyes that they do with milk these days. I just put it on my cereal by faith, trusting as well that the cereal itself has had everything done and it's not going to cause problems in me. And all. So everything by faith. Every time I buy a bacon and cheese zinger burger, I buy it by faith. I've been disappointed a few times. But I buy them by faith anyway. So faith is, is this con faith is something that every human being lives by all the time. So next time somebody says to you, oh, you're just a person of faith, then you can turn around and say, well, so are you. And let me explain why. When you walked into the office today, did you actually get a weight and put it on the chair and just make sure that that weight would hold your body weight before you sat on the chair? Or did you just sit down on the chair? You did that by faith because you just trusted and believed that whoever manufactured the chair made it to safety standards and you could sit on and so on. And, and you can just go through incident after incident after incident. So faith is not just something that's compounded or, or confined to religious societies and religious groups. Faith is the way that every human being lives. So that's why I think it's really important that we break down faith and have a bit of a look at it. So what I want to do today... I want to start by looking at the two extremes of faith that Jesus uh, uh, actually encountered when he was here uh, in his ministry. And, and uh, if you've got a Bible there, can you go with me please to Mark chapter 6? Go to Mark chapter 6. And, and here's one extreme end of the faith scale. And I want you to think about a faith scale, right? And I want you to, to, to uh, this morning, have a think about where do you think you are on that faith scale? And, and know this, that there's, there's no 
condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'll be up front and say this. My faith is still being developed. And as a matter of fact, I believe that my faith will be still in a developmental state the day I leave planet Earth. I will never make it. I'm not going to get there this side of heaven. It's impossible. It's impossible. God's not looking for me to be perfect. And anyone that says, you ever heard those preachers or people that say, that when we talk about faith, they'll put all the responsibility on you. Have you ever heard that kind of preaching? You're not healed because you don't have faith. Anyone ever heard that said to somebody? You're not getting the breakthrough because you don't have enough faith. Whenever we put 100% responsibility onto an individual like that, and we remove grace, it's not God. We live in a, under a covenant of grace. And, and any time you hear preaching with no grace involved, my suggestion is don't run from it. That would be rude. Um, but, but certainly don't take to heart any preaching. Well, I hear people preach about money and they'll take Malachi, bring a whole thing to the storehouse and God will, and, and, and if you don't, then the, the adverse uh, communication is that then you won't be blessed of God. All these types of doctrines that we take to complete extremes. And when, and, and when something gets to an extreme, you can almost always guarantee that grace has been taken out of the picture. When grace is taken out of the picture, my suggestion to you is, is just water off a duck's back. Don't be rude, but, but don't take that kind of stuff to heart. Amen? We're in a covenant of grace and we need grace because none of us are perfect. And we also need grace in this area of faith. And when you have a look, and I did this once, I went through the book of Acts and the Gospels and I looked at every single uh, situation where somebody was healed, right? I just took healing as one thing. And you know what I found? There's no one way that it happened. On many occasions, uh, it was the faith of the person being prayed for that allowed God to do what God wanted to do, bring about healing. It was the faith, and Scripture will attribute it to the person being prayed for. There are other situations where there's not much faith attributed to that person, but the faith was attributed to the person who was praying. Other situations, the faith is attributed to a complete third party. We don't even know whether the person who got healed had faith. Take, take, take for example, the story of the, the men that, was, that, that, that carried their mate to Jesus and ripped open the roof and lowered him down. We don't even know whether that guy had faith. What we know is his four mates had faith, and they carried him to Jesus. So there's no uh, blanket uh, rule or picture of how it all works. But what we do know is this, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we do know that faith is one of those things that God wants us to have when it comes to our relationship with him and his interactions. And, and, and these two extremes that we have, here's the first one, Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6. It says that he could do no miracles there. So Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. We all know the story. And when he walks into town with, 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 with the people with him, and uh, you know, as he comes in, they, they're going, oh, here's Jesus. And then it quickly turns to, well, who does he think he is? Hang on a second. He played, he played touch football with my kid because I had touch football back then. I know they did. That's, it's, it's been around for a long time. Um, he, he, he used to go to Pizza Hut on Friday nights for the all-you-can-eat buffet with my nephew and 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 they start going he, he's, he made the table that's in my kitchen I mean it's just it was a carpenter and, and he made that table and, and they got very familiar with Jesus and and we can get very familiar with God too by the way can't we we can the longer we hang around the church we get very familiar with God I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that, that I even find it funny to say you know when people say yeah I know God anyone ever hear that phrase I know God I know exactly what we mean yeah I know God but, but if I dig a little bit deeper under that phrase, I've got to come, I come to the conclusion that goes, I think I know a bit about God. But I'll guarantee there's more about God that I don't know. I'll guarantee that. There's more about God that I don't know, but I think I know a bit about God. And I'm on a journey to continue to discover more and more about God, and I think that's a better way to communicate it. But these people thought they'd worked out Jesus, and he was just the kid that used to run around in the park and so on. And it says that he could, do no, he could not do any miracles there. And it doesn't say because he didn't want to. He, he actually wanted to. Jesus came into that community to do something. He, he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to heal some sick people, cast out some demons. He wanted to, to preach with conviction and change some people's lives, plant some seeds of hope and life inside their hearts so that their world would be different. That, that, that's what he came to do. 
But it says he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, which in the Greek literally means a few minor ailments. That's what it means in the Greek. So, you know, he, somebody had a, a real bad headache and he prayed for them and the headache disappeared. Now, in our day today, we would call that a revival. We'd be excited. The guy that prayed for the headache would get a speaking tour all around the world, write a couple of books. Uh, but apparently in Jesus' day, curing a couple of minor ailments really wasn't enough. It wasn't much. Sometimes our expectations and standards are way down here and God's going, you know what? Here's the thing. Once upon a time, there was nothing. And I said, let there be, and there was. And you're excited about the possibility of me maybe curing your ingrown toenail. (laughs) Come on. I can do a little more than that. Come on. Trust me. Let's go on a journey. Let's do some things. Step out in faith, see what happens. So anyway... He goes down there and it says he couldn't do many things except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Isn't that amazing? He was amazed at their lack of faith. In other words, he wasn't just going, oh, there's a lack of faith here, that's okay. That's okay. Because I've got no expectation that anyone really believes this stuff anyway. I've got no expectation that any of this stuff's going to change your life. But... Yeah, I hope it does, mate. I've got no expectation now. And, 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 but he was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed. I, I, I think today that, that we're, probably, we're probably so used to a lack of faith that it doesn't amaze us anymore. Anyone sort of agree with that? I think we're so, our expectations are so low and we've just come to accept that life is what life is and maybe and nothing can change and, and maybe, the, maybe, maybe the way God operated back then, maybe what God did to reveal his glory to mankind because when God healed and when God, all these things were not done so that, that everybody would go, Paul the Apostle, what an amazing preacher, Let's, we, we got to get him into our churches. It wasn't done for the glory of any man, God did everything he did for the glory of God. So that people would fall on their faces and go, wow, that's a God worth giving your life to. That's the God of the universe. That's the one that we're going to give the remainder of our day. That's the God that I'm going to follow, I'm going to listen to, I'm going to serve. That's the God I'm going to point people to because that God can do things. That God is real. He's not Casper, the friendly ghost. He's actually God. But he was amazed at their lack of faith, right? So... So God gets amazed at a lack of faith. That tells me something. If he's amazed at the lack of faith, that tells me that there's a a sensible and quiet expectation in the heart of God that when people encounter Jesus, that their faith would just go up a peg, would just go up a little bit more. That our expectation, that our belief would just go up that little bit more. I think that's a fair assessment. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't be amazed at it. He would have just gone, oh, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. It doesn't matter. I'm used to this. But he wasn't used to that because some places he went, guess what? He did some amazing things. But he goes back there. And so, so there's one end of the spectrum where there's this complete lack of faith. And, and lack of faith, by the way, is powerful enough to stop the Son of God from doing what the Son of God came to do. Isn't that an amazing thought? At, that's a sobering thought for me, that my lack of faith can, doesn't always, because there's no pattern there where you can say this is the way it works. It's not true. You'll find places where there didn't appear to be a lot of faith, yet God still did things. Right? But having said that, I think that when I read that story and go, Jesus wanted to do some things, but their lack of faith actually held him back from doing what he wanted to do, I find that very sobering in my life. I want to increase my faith. I want my, when, when Jesus comes into my town or into my space or, or whatever's going on, I, I, I want to at least be, be aiming for that place where I've got a, a bit of faith for him to work with. It might not be much, but I want to have a bit of faith for him to work with because I'd hate for him to come in and go, I want to do something here, but you lack so much. Your faith is so low. It's so lacking that you're actually inhibiting my capacity to want to do something. Not to want to do something, but you're inhibiting my capacity to actually do something. That's what we're seeing here. It's one extreme. Now if we go and look at the other end of the scale, here's another one to look at. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5 to 10. I love this story and you've all heard it many, many times. Nothing I'm, nothing I'm saying to you today is, is new, okay? But, but just because it's not new, how many, he, 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 let me just ask a question, how many of you have heard a million, well that's a big exaggeration, you've probably never heard a million, but how many of you have heard 
tens or hundreds of sermons and messages and read books on prayer, yet you're humble enough to go, but I still rarely ever pray. I'm not expecting hands to go up. I don't want to see hands. I'm using that as an illustration because I'm sitting here nodding without you seeing me nod, going, yeah, that's right, Al. That's, that's you. You're reading your own mail there, brother. Because it's not about what we know. It's not about what we know. It's not about the information we've gathered about a topic or about God. It's, it's what difference is that making? What are we doing with that information that we have? Are we actually allowing it to transform and to change us? Or are we happy just to have lots of information about God? Are we happy just to know how faith works and justification and sanctification and all these Christianese words that we use? Are we happy just to understand the Greek and the Hebrew? Are we happy to know all the kings in order of their appearance? And are we happy to know how the north and south um, uh, you know, unified again? Are, are, are we happy just to know the cultural aspects of what the world was like under the Romans? For, are we happy just to know all this information? Or are we really wanting transformation in our lives? Because I think the goal, from Jesus' point of view, the goal was never just to give you information. Jesus came to transform lives and to transform hearts. And he gave information in order. Information was the seed that if taken to heart and allowed to germinate with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of a person could bring about change in their life. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 to 10. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for him. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? It's a pretty cool question. And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed again. Remember before, he was amazed at their lack of faith. Here's Jesus being amazed again. He was amazed and he said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with what? Such great faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. But here he is amazed in a good way, going, Man, I have not come across anybody with faith like you're seeing right here, right now. Now, what caused Jesus' declaration of such great faith? I believe it was the centurion's declaration of just say the word. Just say a word, Jesus. All, all you need to do is tell me that this is how it should be. Tell me this is how it's going to be. And that's enough for me. Anyone Ever heard anyone say, oh, the Bible says that that settles it? You ever heard that little pithy saying? Yeah, kind of, I guess, a little bit like that, but maybe not to the e extreme that you, you might have heard it before. You see that... The foundation of our faith is the character and nature of God. We've talked about that. If you, don't, if you don't trust the character and nature of a person, you don't trust anything they say. End of story. Yeah? If, you don't trust, if I don't trust your character and your nature, I don't care what you say to me, I'm always second-guessing, going, I just don't know. Is it true? Is it not? I don't know. So the foundation of our faith is God's character and nature. God is trustworthy. He's faithful. He doesn't tell lies. That's, that's, we've talked about this already. So the foundation of our faith is the character and nature of God, but the materials we use to build on that foundation is the Word of God. I told you before, I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't heard before this morning. The, the, the materials we use to build our faith are the Word of God. Here's what the centurion was saying. He said, I trust the character and nature of God, and I know that what you say comes from him. So whatever he says, I know that's the truth. I don't need to have your presence in the room. I just need to have your word. I just need to have your word, Jesus. Just tell me that it's going to happen, and it'll happen. I don't even need your presence in there. Sometimes I feel like within the content of Western Christianity these days, and, and, and I don't mean to point fingers or anything but I'm a western Christian so that's the context I'd speak into sometimes I feel like we are we're so feelings oriented nothing wrong with feelings but sometimes I think we get so feelings oriented that if we're not feeling it if I feel like God's word's true I'll obey it it's not about feeling like his word is true anyone ever wake up and not feel like God's there one humble person in the room I wake up some days, I don't feel like God is there. Some days when I preach, guess what? I'm preaching right now, guess what? I am not hearing angelic, say this, say that, now go here. I'm not hearing that, you know? 
I don't even feel a goosebump when I pray sometimes. We prayed out there this morning. I didn't even get a goosebump. I felt so ripped off. And so I fell on the floor and cried, Where's God? What have I done wrong? I haven't got a goosebump. No, no I didn't. I know God's with me because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God said, when two or more are gathered, I'm there in their presence. That's all I need. I just need, like the centurion, you say the word. You tell me what the terms and conditions of this Christian life are, God. You tell me, you tell me what I can stand on and what's right and what's real. And whether I feel it or not, that's secondary. Feelings are secondary. It's just, what is your word? Because it's the word of God that's the building materials that we use to build on the foundation of the character of God. It's the word of God that we build a strong faith life on. It's the Word of God that we need to get into us. It's the Word of God that we need to know. It's the Word of God that we need to stand on because it's the Word of God that builds, that we use to build a strong Christian walk. It's the Word of God that we use to build a strong Christian life. If I was to ask you the question, whereabouts are you on the scale, what would you say? At one end, you've got a guy going, just say the Word, and that settles it for me. I'll stand on it. I'll go home. I don't need your presence to walk with me to the house. I don't need to get home and feel Jesus in the room. You just tell me, and I'm going to act as if that's happened. And with that, the centurion turns and walks away, and it says that when he gets home that very hour, his servant was healed. But then you've got this other group of people who Jesus came, and by this stage they know who Jesus apparently is and all the things he's been doing, but they decided that they're going to second-guess everything they've heard about Jesus. They second-guess everything about the word and diminish it and go, no, 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 we know who you are. We've got our own interpretation of who you are. And it created a space that had such a lack of faith that God couldn't do anything. You know, all of us are somewhere on that scale, aren't we? We're sort of all somewhere along the journey. And that's normal, and it's going to continue to be normal, uh, no matter how spiritual you may feel you are or how many theology classes you get high distinctions in. I've done theology class. You know what? I came to the conclusion at the end of it. All I realized is this. I get a high distinction for this particular topic over here, which I did. And at the end of the day, all it really means is theologically, you and me agree the same on that particular thing. Because I could answer that same question the same way at this college over here, and they'd fail me. They found me. Now, no matter where you are on the faith scale, the good news today is that your faith can grow and it should be growing. God wants it to grow. 2 Corinthians 10, 15, Paul writes this. He says, Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. He's speaking about his, his, their work that they've done in the Corinthian church and the investment they put into these people. And their, He says, we don't go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. As your faith continues to grow. This is Paul writing to Christians, saying, as your faith continues to grow. If you think about your faith and you think about your life, is your faith continuing to grow or is faith just like a, we, we, plant, we potted the plant once and we just put it there and now we just go about our life and just hope that, it, hope that something happens over here with the pot plant. I've got faith now, so I've just, okay, that looks nice and I'm just going to go back about the rest of my life without any thought to the nurturing and the fertilising and the watering and the growing of that seed of faith in Jesus Christ that you have in your life. Well, I believe that when we read the New Testament that there's a healthy expectation on the part of God that our faith be growing and that our faith grows by the things that we do, not by just sitting down praying, saying, God, would you make my faith grow? Oh, Lord, would you give me more faith? God, would you make... Romans ten seventeen says this. Now, Paul is specifically writing here about salvation, how a person comes to faith. So you, one day you're not walking with Jesus at all and then all of us at some point uh, came to a place in our world where we weren't following Jesus, then something happened, we heard about Christ. I was 12 years of age, I shared this story recently, I was 12 years of age when I first heard the name of Jesus. A seed was planted, I came to faith at 19, but 12 was when a seed was planted. So Paul's talking here about salvation of people coming to faith. And he says this, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes into our world by hearing something. So in other words, you hear something, and, and when you hear something, that seed, because thoughts and words are seeds, and, and we hear that thing, and that seed goes in, and whatever that thing is has the capacity to be planted in us and to begin to build faith in us. You know, 
Somebody tells you that, that this is the best investment of your life. You should sink all your money in this, go home right now, sell your house, sell your car, sell your children, send your wife out to work and invest in this thing. And I guarantee you in two weeks' time, you'll buy your house back, you'll buy your kids back, your wife will stop working and you'll be the richest man on planet Earth. Just do. And, and, and the more they plant this seed, you start, it starts getting in you and you start getting faith in it. And before you know it, um, Bruce goes home and says to Fleur, I've got something to tell you, Fleur. <laughs> and then next week he comes to church by himself. You didn't do an investment last week, did you, Bruce? No? Okay. Just checking, mate. Just checking. So this verse is speaking specifically about the salvation process. However, the principle is the same in all other areas. And what we see in this verse, very quickly to finish up, we see this. It says that faith comes. So here's the good news for you. You might be sitting here now going, oh, I don't know Jesus. And I know we have people that come along here to arise and they haven't stepped across that line yet. And I've had conversations with you and you're still working it out. And that's fantastic. Let me encourage you. You're in the right place if you're genuinely checking out Jesus. So, so what happens is that faith can come to you. You might have no faith right now in Christ, but the good news is that faith can come to you. Amen? Faith is something that can actually come into your world. Here, the writer says faith comes. In other words, faith wasn't already there. Faith for self, it wasn't already there, but faith came to you because you were in the right place and you heard the right messages, and so faith can come. So even sitting here right now, there are probably people in this room, maybe you know Jesus, but maybe you need faith to come to you in certain areas. Some people don't have faith to believe that God will fight for them. So they spend their whole life defending themselves because they don't believe God will fight on their behalf. Some people don't have faith to believe that God will supply all the provision they need for life. So they're always hoarding and trying to get more and more and more. Some people don't have faith to believe that God will promote them in the right time. So they're always running around trying to promote themselves to everybody. Some people don't have faith to believe that Jesus' death was enough to make them right in the sight of the Father. So they're diving and running around trying to do more religious works to get right with the Father. Because they just don't quite have the faith yet. I mean, it's a, it's a big call, isn't it? That Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago died on a cross and his death 2,000 years ago made you right with God regardless. If you put your faith in Christ, you're right with God now. That's a big thing to believe, isn't it? If you never prayed another prayer... It was the death of Christ that made you right with God. You'll miss out on so much in this Christian life by not having a relationship and communing and bringing those those things to God and seeing the benefits of prayer in your world. But your salvation is not based on how many prayers you pray. Your salvation is not based on how many Bible verses you memorized or how much scripture you've you've read today. It's it's not how long your quiet time was. You are saved by grace through faith by an act of of a man called Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? But, they, but, but, but if we're honest, there are still a lot of people today, we don't have faith in that. We don't have faith in that. We believe it and we're entered into it, but to relax enough to enjoy the rest of faith and go, I don't need to keep doing religious observances to try to get his love. I've already got his love. A lot of people still don't believe that. They're saved, they're going to heaven, but they're still striving to try to attain something that Jesus attained for them 2,000 years ago on the cross. How do I know that? Well, because you've got to get the the word of God, get that seed in you and in you and in you and get the word of God in you till that seed begins to germinate till one day you start actually believing some of the stuff that's written in this thing. One day you actually start embracing it and start believing. So faith can come even if you don't have faith. And then it tells us that faith comes from hearing. So, So if faith's going to come, then that means you've got to be listening, don't you? If you want faith in your life, you've got to be listening. You have to have your ears open and you have to be listening. If faith comes by hearing, you need to be listening and listening is an intentional and a deliberate thing. And it takes focus to listen to somebody. In order to hear God, we need to put ourselves in a position to hear him. Any surfers in the room? Anyone go surfing? Got a couple of surfers yet? I used to surf years ago before we realised there were sharks off the coast of Ballina. And then I sold my surfboard and I have not been out for a long time because I knew they were there but... No one cared until they started biting people. And then I was like, I'm out of here. I never came back. Never went back. Call me soft. That's okay. I'll take it. I just say, Jesus called me out of the water. He told me to. <laughs> no, no, I'm just scared the shark's going to bite me leg off. So um, here I'm talking about faith. Um, <sighs> smite me, almighty oh smiter. But I used to go surfing. And here's the thing about surfing, right? You go out there and you paddle out into the water. And you want to catch a wave, right? The goal is to get yourself in a position to catch a wave. Now, here's what I learned in my time of surfing. I can put myself 
in a place where the waves are. The waves are there. That's where the waves are. And if I want to catch a wave, you know what I've got to do? I've got to go to the place where the waves are in order to catch the wave. And now, how often have you been, to the, been there and you're there and everyone's, because it's crowded and, you know, a lot of people are there, so sometimes you go there and you go, I can't be bothered with the crowds. So I'm going to go and park myself over here where there's no crowd. Now, why do you think there's no crowd over here? There's no waves over there. And it doesn't matter how long I stayed there, guess what? Not once was I ever able to get the waves to move to come to me. I had to go to where the waves were. And if we're going to build faith, and if we're going to listen to the Word of God, then here's the thing. You've got to put yourself in a place where the Word of God is, not think, I can just do it anywhere, and the Word of God will come to me. Put yourself in places where the Word of God is, where you have an opportunity to hear from God, whether it be attending church on a Sunday, getting in a room and hearing somebody preach, whether it be having a quiet time and actually picking up this and getting the dust off and going, God, I'm just going to sit and have a read for a bit, or whether it be in that place of prayer where you silence yourself and allow God to speak into your spirit and so on. But if you want to hear, if faith comes by hearing and you want faith and you know the only way to get faith is to hear, you've got to put yourself in places where you have the opportunity to hear. Amen? That's just one plus one equals two. That one ain't rocket science. That's an easy one. We've got to put ourselves in a position where people, where you can actually hear. And those basic disciplines, by the way, of prayer, reading the Bible and attending fellowship, they, they have been the same basic disciplines the church have followed for 2,000 years. All of a sudden in 2022, we think we're smarter than that and we've got our own ways of doing things. And unfortunately, if, if I'm looking at it objectively, I'm going, okay, let's go back to what they used to do. Seems simple. A lot of people think it's just religious and old-fashioned, but God was doing amazing things. The church was doing amazing things. Fast forward, now we think we've got all these other ways of doing things. They don't seem to be working as well. We're more fragmented and I certainly feel like I'm not seeing the power of God in my community like I did back then. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to, to go back and... and, and, and and go, you know what, there are some basic disciplines of the Christian life that aren't religious. They're actually quite healthy. They're actually quite healthy. And finally, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the kind of faith that Paul's talking about, this specific type of faith that'll build a Christian life, he's saying that kind of faith comes by hearing, but hearing a specific voice. And he says that specific voice is hearing the word of God above all other voices. Hearing the word of God above all other voices. If, how many voices are you hearing in a day? How many voices are screaming at you from advertisements on TV, from television shows and their values that they're throwing at us and, and getting us to you know, just soften the blow of something so that we start laughing at something that back in Jesus' day he probably would have been repulsed by, but it's now funny to us because we've kind of slowly been conditioned to going, oh, it doesn't really matter, it's, you know, it's all fine. How many voices are screaming at you? We have to try. We actually have to discipline ourselves to listen to God these days. We do. And everybody's going to say, and I hear it all the time, everybody says, I don't have time to come on a Sunday or I don't have time to read my Bible. But we have the same 24-hour time period that our great-great-great-great-grandparents had. They had 24 hours a day as well. It's not that we don't have time. Again, we're just much more distracted nowadays. We're so much more distracted instead of having a cup, two or three things. Once upon a time, that people had two or three things that filled their life. They went to work, they loved their family, and they had a hobby or something nice and simple. Now life is so complicated and so busy and so many options and activities and things that, that, that we're so diluted with time and then we turn around and when it comes to God, we go, well, that's the thing I don't have time for anymore. And I know that life is busy. I know that. I've, we've raised four kids and we've done all the stuff that we've done as well in life. We're not superhumans. But I know this. If I prioritize, at the end of the day, my week, everything that I prioritize happens for me. That's the bottom line. And I don't like that thought because sometimes it, 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 it makes me feel uncomfortable in my own world. But the truth is, if I get to the end of a week and I, I, or end of a day and I don't bother praying or reading the Bible or you know, whatever, I, I, what I do know is this whatever was a priority for me, that's what I did. And then I'm faced with the fact that, okay, maybe that wasn't as much of a priority as I thought it was to me. So I've got to readjust my priorities every now and then. See, once upon a time, let me leave you this, this thought. Once upon a time, the world was in its right order. Faith was the default of creation. You remember that? Adam and Eve. You ever thought about that? When Adam and Eve were created, they were created with faith. We're born into a world of unbelief. They were created into a world of faith. Faith was their default, and now unbelief is really the default of the day. And how did it change? We'll go back to the Garden of Eden, 
Genesis 3, 1 to 5, and look at this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, and by the way, it's not a gender thing. He said to the woman because she was there, could have been the man. Makes no difference. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you'll die. And the devil says you will not certainly die. So God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. You'll know good from evil. See, the devil knew that if he could get humanity to go against the word of God, if he could twist the word of God, then he could diminish faith. And if he could diminish faith, he could diminish God's activity in the world. Mark chapter 6, when Jesus went into Nazareth and could do nothing. It's very, very interesting what he did as soon as he confronted that unbelief. Mark chapter 6, verse 6. I don't know if you've got it there, Luke. It says, He was amazed at their lack of faith. And then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. The New King James says, Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. You see, the antidote to unbelief from Jesus' perspective is teach the word of God. As soon as Jesus was confronted with such unbelief that he couldn't do what he wanted to do and what he knew the Father wanted to do, he said, I've got to get out there and we've got to teach the word of God. Now, I know some people are sitting there going, he didn't have a Bible. Well, he had the Old Testament scriptures. And John tells us in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus was the living word. And he went about and he taught God's ways and he taught about the Father. And that's what he did to try to build unbelief. And I still believe today, some people think they're going to build their faith by chasing prophets from town to town. I've got no problem with hearing what prophets have to say. I think it's wonderful, it's a valid gift, but chasing prophecy around town is not going to build your personal faith. Running from conference to conference to hear the world's greatest speakers, it's not necessarily going to build your faith. It may pump you up. How many of you ever heard a great speaker? You got all pumped up and excited and decided, oh, the well, world's going to change, I'm going to do this, and three weeks later you're the same person you were. Anyone else? Or is that just me as well? I do it all the time. Go away, get all pumped and excited. It's like someone pumps your tyres up. It's like, it's, it's like somebody gives you a Red Bull. Not that I drink Red Bull and not that I would encourage you drinking Red Bull, but I've been told that if you get, drink Red Bull, you get wings to fly, apparently. You know that ad? I remember a mate of mine saying, every time I have a Red Bull, my heart starts racing and I'm running around like this. And Okay, I don't know. I don't touch the stuff myself. But it's kind of like that. We go away to these things, we get a buzz. But then we come back and we're the same person back in our same morning and afternoon daily routines doing the same things that we do and it dissipates because it doesn't really build faith the way that the word of God does. What about Kurong? The latest book at Kurong is being advertised and everyone's saying this one's a game changer, it's a world changer. I've been through countless books that were, were going to change the Christian church and we were never going to be the same again because of this great revelation of this great writer and no disrespect to them, by the way, is it probably was a great revelation and was God. What I'm saying is this, we hang all our hats on that and go, that's what's going to change the church, going to change the world, going to change my life and we read it and we underline it and we highlight it and we take notes and we talk to someone about it and then maybe someone gets up and everyone preaches about it for a month, then about two months later, three months later, we're back where we were with the same people with the same faith level. Nothing is going to build your faith more than consistent time in the Word of God. Nothing is going to build your faith more than consistent time in the Word of God. I'll leave you with this. Dwight L. Moody once said this. He said, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. One day, I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study, and faith has been growing ever since. Amen? We need to build our faith. You want to know who Jesus is? Get in the word. Who you are? Get in the word. What you have in God? Get in the word. How you should live? Get in the word of God. If you want to build your faith, Get into the Word of God. Simple message, nothing profound, but I could preach the same message for a whole year. You could hear it 52 times a year. The challenge for you is will you pick up your Bible and will you get disciplined in reading it? And that's the challenge for me as well. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. Thank you.
again, Lord, for the chance to be here together, Lord. We, we are so privileged to have this freedom and opportunity to do this, Lord. And God, we do pray uh, uh, right now as we finish up as well. We pray for uh, the church in Ukraine, Lord. We pray for the people in the Ukraine right now. We, we, we just thank you for their bold faith, God, that, that, Father, they have stayed, many of them. Lord, they're in underground bunkers worshipping you and having church services and not allowing what's happening in the world around them to diminish their faith. But they're witnessing for you. They're reaching out to people. Holy Spirit, would you just empower them, embolden them, protect them in that place. So, Father, we, we, we do acknowledge that, uh, God, the freedoms that we have over here in this country are rare compared to a lot of other places. And so we thank you for the chance to gather. Lord, I pray uh, with what we've talked about today, Lord, would you take the seed of your word? Would you take whatever it is that you've been saying to people this morning? Holy Spirit, would you water that seed? Would you fertilize that seed? And God, I pray that it wouldn't just be another one of the 52 messages we're going to hear this, this year, but for each of us in this room, Lord, let us walk away and ask ourselves the question, so what's it going to mean to me after I leave this building? And Father, in the next seven days as we go about our community, would you give every single one of us the opportunity to tell somebody about you, God, somebody out there right now that does not know there's a God in heaven that loves them, that Jesus died for them, that they can have a relationship with you. Let us bump into those people this week and let us have the opportunity to tell them about Jesus and to show them the goodness of God. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Uh, Bless you guys.